built and founded by entrepreneur scientists. So we are very happy to have Professor Lin, who is the NUSS uh, Chair Professor for the Department of Biomedical Engineering, as well as the Director of iHealth Tech, to share with us his experiences of experiences of innovating within the healthcare sector, as well as co-founding six startups. So Professor Lin, please. Yeah. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank SG Innovate for giving me this opportunity uh, to give this talk. It's been months in the making, and I couldn't make it for some of the dates that they proposed, so finally I'm here. Uh, so, for today, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the, how uh, we innovate health uh, through some of the research we have been doing in our lab. But before that, let me take my clicker. <laughs> Sorry, I think there is no battery in it. <laughs> oh, it's over here. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me yeah. check. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so I'm actually a, a mechanical engineer by training. Actually, I did my PhD in, in Cambridge, and I wasn't doing anything bio during that time. It's only when I came back to NUS, and then I started my research, I decided to do something more bio-related, because that was actually almost 20 years ago, where uh, the government put a lot of money into uh, biomedical sciences research. And so uh, I was involved in actually setting up the program, the biomedical engineering program. And I thought that uh, being trained in the area of mechanics, perhaps I might be able to use my expertise to uh, conduct some research uh, that will be very be relevant uh, to the, the uh, in the area of medicine. So, uh, so I did. I go into the area of uh, cell mechanics, molecular, molecular mechanics. After this, I'll share, share with you uh, how we actually use some of our research findings uh, to develop very uh, effective uh, diagnostics, uh, in particular in the area of cancer and then there after diabetes. So I'm going to talk about uh, right now about advancing health through innovation. And uh, so uh, for a start, we know Singapore actually has the world's uh, highest life expectancy. If you don't know that, actually a few weeks ago, uh, it's been announced that Singapore has actually the, the highest life expectancy. But what about good health? So if you look at the MOH uh, report, uh, many of Singaporeans actually spend about 10.8 years in very poor health. So we may be living very long uh, lives, but then uh, we may actually be spending the last last 10 years actually in, in very uh, poor health. Uh, so, so, so what happens is when one gets older, we are also very susceptible to diseases. So if you look at, at uh, some of the leading causes of death, uh, certainly uh, heart disease is, is ranked number one, and then we have stroke, uh, uh, lung cancer, and so on. And in fact, if you uh, look at the statistics, right, every day right now, uh, 16 people will die from cardiovascular diseases, and we expect that to actually uh, increase uh, later on. And also, uh, one in four men and one in five uh, here is likely to get cancer when you reach the age of 75 years old. So it's very obvious that as we live longer, we are very much susceptible to diseases. Uh, and so this is a, a, a kind of a worrying problem uh, for, for the government. And of course, uh, it means that uh, uh, we are now constantly waging war against uh, diseases. And we know, uh, for example, a few years ago, uh, the, uh, the government has declared war on diabetes, right? And uh, in fact, it's not just diabetes that we're going to deal with, but there are also other diseases, cancer, stroke, and so on. In fact, we are fighting a, a, against an enemy that you know, never compromises, never discriminates, and, and never sleeps. Uh, sounds like a, a bank advertisement. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but this is the truth. I mean, uh, it is an enemy that's very hard to fight. Of course, there are many strategies for us to do that. Uh, drug development and so on is, uh, are some of the strategies. But uh, at least uh, for me and, and, and our institute, we very much would like to actually use medical technologies as one of the strategies in fighting against uh, diseases. It's like in war, uh, we need to have uh, technologies in terms like tanks, airplanes, and, and so on, uh, artillery. So for us uh, to fight uh, to wage a war against diseases, we're going to use medical technologies. And in fact, if you look at the hospital itself, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there will not be any modern hospital without any technology. Uh, in fact, if you go to a hospital without any technology, you'll feel very insecure. You're not sure whether you're going to get uh, proper treatment. But looking at just the hospital itself, uh, you can see how technology has played a very important role uh, in not only diagnosing, but also treating diseases. 
And, and so, uh, so I always like to tell my engineering students that you know, without engineers, uh, there will be no more than ho day hospital uh, just to motivate them to get into you know, biomedical engineering and, and do something good. Uh, so this is actually a, a fact and, and uh, technology has been, has been so um, uh, pervasive that you know, it just cannot uh, do any, any uh, good uh, medical treatment without it. So, uh, so, so before I go on, I just want to maybe introduce to you uh, uh, an institute that I'm currently heading as director. Uh, it's called the Institute for Health Innovation and Technology. And uh, our vision actually is to advance health uh, through innovation. And really at this uh, institute, when we first started it about three years ago, uh, our aim actually is to work closely with the clinicians to develop medical technologies that would benefit the patients. So if you look at the mission, right, what we're trying to do, uh, first is we want to identify what are the uh, clinical unmet needs first. Uh, and uh, it's very important because uh, I know as a res researcher myself, not just here in Singapore, but around the world, we are researchers and we have our pet project. We work on certain technology. And, and once we are successful, we start to look for people to use the technology. So it's like we are developing solution, uh, 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 looking for a problem to solve, instead of, of trying to develop a, sol a solution that will solve a, a problem. So if we can actually identify clinical and med needs by talking to the clinicians uh, and knowing what the problems are, and we develop the technology, then it's most likely to be uh, adopted and, and used. And of course, uh, once we, we we identify the clinical and med needs. The next thing is we try to innovate uh, very disruptive health solutions and, and technologies because we want to do something that's very innovative, very new, novel. Uh, and, uh, and also being in this institute, a another mission is actually to be able to bring this technology eventually for use in the, uh, uh, in the hospital and clinic. So we also want to incubate and bring this health tech from the bench to the bedside. And ultimately, we want to impact, uh, create a positive impact on patients, doctors, and society. By impact, we means that not only extending the lifespan of the patients, but also uh, increasing the health span of the patients as well. Uh, so this is what we're trying to do. And of course, if you look at the way we work, it's a tripartite collaboration, not only between universities and hospital, uh, but also between university and industry as well, because as we develop technology, we want to uh, you know, spin out, uh, we want to license it so that the industry can pick it up and then develop the technology eventually for actual use in the hospital. And uh, in fact, uh, come next year, we're going to move to a new building. It's an eight-story uh, building that will be housed in the Faculty of Engineering. And so in this new building, we're going to move in there also, but some of the biomedical engineering professors also will move in there. So it's kind of a, a, a building that is dedicated to doing biomedical uh, uh, technology research. And of course, uh, currently, actually, we are still located in the uh, hospital just next to NUH. In fact, just a street across the hospital. Uh, we will still keep that, that space. Uh, because after we develop technology over here, we'll bring that technology to, to that, that, that particular location next to the hospital so we can cl conduct clinical trial and so on. Uh, so this is what is happening uh, over uh, at, at NUS. And uh, in fact, uh, if you ask me what are the different technologies we're working on, uh, this will give you a snapshot of some of the different technologies we are working on. So there are actually three research areas that we're focusing on. The first is actually precision medicine. Uh, second is smart sensors and AI. And then the third is uh, mental health and aging. So if you look at precision medicine, uh, for example, we are developing uh, non-invasive uh, liquid uh, biopsies for disease diagnosis. So it's like taking blood from patient uh, and then see if we can uh, identify certain circula uh, circulating biomarkers that may uh, you know, help uh, in terms of uh, detecting and diagnosing, for example, cancer is one of them. Uh, but apart from that, we are also developing, uh, for example, uh, what we call patient-derived organoid platforms. So these are microfluidic devices with micro wells where we take uh, cells from patient and then we grow them into an organoid and then we do drug tests thereafter. So, uh, so that the cells are actually uh, derived from patients. And so the, the cells can be can actually grow very differently from patient to patient. But the idea is that eventually once we get the cells from patients, we grow it within one or two weeks, then we can do drug tests and see which are the drugs and the dosage of drug that's most effective in killing the cancer. And, and with that information, then we know what are the best treatment to give to the patient. So that helps us to fulfill what we call precision medicine or, or, or personalized treatment. Then uh, we are also now working with pancreatic cancer surgeons as well to see how best to not only early detect uh, cancer patients, uh, 
uh, pancreatic cancer patients, but also how best to treat the patient using precision therapy. Uh, one of our colleagues actually is doing a very interesting uh, research uh, on magnetic stimulation on muscle recovery. So, so the idea is that uh, when a patient suffers injury, especially elderly patient, uh, they may not be uh, suitable to go for rehabilitation, exercise rehabilitation, because they are very weak. So by subjecting the muscle uh, to this pulse magnetic field, actually it, it kind of promote growth uh, to the muscles. So in fact, he has done uh, some animal trial, it seems to work, and now he's actually extending it to uh, a human trial, and he has a company actually to now to uh, commercialize this system. Uh, of course, the other area is smart sensors and AI, and so we have been developing uh, sensors not only in terms of wearable sensors for monitoring vital signs and, and uh, you know vital signs like heart rate, uh, blood pressure. We are ever, we also developing sensors to you know help a man with erectile dysfunction to developing e-skin for prosthesis, especially patients who lose a, uh, the sense of touch. Uh, we can actually develop some of this e-skin that can help them to regain this sense of touch. Yeah, of course, we have also developed uh, in-source sensors for diabetic foot ulcer management, which I'll talk about afterwards, uh, and also a smart textile for wearable electronics. So this, this smart textile is made of what we call metal material, and it can actually confer privacy to the data in the sense that if you're wearing fitness tracker, uh, we are constantly uh, trying to collect data uh, from the tracker. So this, uh, when they wear this, uh, this uh, e-smart uh, textile, uh, smart e-textile, actually the data is kind of enclosed within the body. It's kind of, kind of like a Friday cage concept. Uh, if someone far away uses a phone, Bluetooth or whatever, they will not be able to tap on the data. Uh, so this is quite interesting. In fact, it, it's been uh, recently uh, uh, being uh, uh, showcased in uh, Reuters News and also CTGN as well. Uh, of course, we also have colleagues who are developing AI-driven apps uh, for healthy eating. So it's like taking pictures of, of uh, food they're going to eat, you know, how much calories you're going to take, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. Yeah, of course, he himself is, uh, is also in, involved in helping to analyze about 100,000 fitness trackers data. Uh, so, so this is uh, in our work. Then we have also one colleague who is doing uh, mental health and aging. So basically, he is looking at imaging, uh, detec uh, doing imaging detection of mental disorder. So he's using this uh, technique called uh, functional near uh, inf uh, infrared spectroscopy. So it's like uh, currently in the hospital, the way we detect patients with mental disorder is to do a, a, an assessment questionnaire, uh, and that can be very subjective. Uh, whereas in Japan, uh, they not only make the patient do the questionnaire, they also have this, this device that's like a, like a cap uh, that they worn on the head, and you can actually measure blood flow. And from the data that we have seen, uh, the blood flow is very different for healthy volunteers versus patients with schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, and so on. Uh, so that kind of gives a more objective uh, uh, kind of diagnosis of the patient, apart from you know, them doing questionnaires. Yeah, so these are all very interesting uh, technologies we're developing in our lab, and of course, our aim is eventually to bring this out uh, for use in the hospital and, and clinic. So, so you ask me what is the aim of doing all this, you know, developing all these technologies. Actually, there are three aims. One is uh, prevention. If we can do, we can go for uh, prevent. If we can prevent diseases from happening, that will be the best. But we know that certain diseases, for example, are genetically linked, and patients may succumb to it. Uh, if that's the case, uh, then can we go for early detection? That's the second part. So for early detection, if we can detect early as, pos as early as possible, uh, diseases as early as possible, then we might be able to better treat the patient. Uh, but if, if that can, cannot be helped, then can we go for a more uh, a precise or personalized treatment of the patient? So given two patients, for example, suffering from the same cancer, say lung cancer, uh, and you give the same treatment, the outcome can be very different. And one of the reasons, uh, you know, uh, based on my research in cancer is that uh, patient uh, actually have a very unique composition of cancer cells. So cancer cells are not homogeneous or uniform. They can actually uh, uh, comprise of many different subtypes. Some are malignant, some are benign. So one pa patient may have more malignant cells, some patients may have more benign cells, and some patients may have certain mutation, some patients may not have. So, uh, so if we can know what is the composition of cancer cells or what kind of mutation the patient is suffering from, then we can administer the right drug to the right patient. So that is more towards precision of personalized treatment. Um, then the other thing I just wanted to actually uh, 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 let you know is that uh, in uh, 
just a couple months back uh, in July, we actually started a new uh, health technologies consortium. It's a Singapore Health Technologies Consortium, and it's a national level initiative uh, supported by NRF, uh, National Research Foundation. Uh, uh, and our mission actually is to try to capture value by enabling quicker transfer of the uh, knowledge and IP from uh, the research at the Institute of Higher Learning to the industry. Uh, so, so you look at NRF, uh, NRF actually set up quite a number of industrial symposiums, I think almost about 10 or more symposiums. This is the first on health technologies. And in fact, they, they, uh, NRI approached me, so I'm currently the director of this uh, health tech consortium. And our aim uh, uh, is really to see how we, we can have quicker transfer of, of uh, technologies developed at the universities uh, and some of the institute of higher learning to the industry. So, so because health tech is so wide, I mean, so, so you know, there are so many areas, we uh, decided to just focus on two for this uh, consortium. So one is health sensing technology, and our aim is to see if we can um, uh, look at technologies that can uh, capture, for example, physical, chemical, or biological inputs. So it could be like you know, measuring a person's uh, uh, movement uh, and, uh, or a heart, heartbeat and so on to chemical. It could be through saliva or through sweat. Uh, and also biological, for example, you can get samples from the patients uh, from blood, uh, and then uh, try to do it as in the least invasive manner as possible. And then, uh, of course, once you capture all this data using sensors, you want to make sense out of it. So the second area is actually health analytics and AI. Uh, because we collect so much data, uh, we want to make sense of data, we want to see but which data, which part of the data are actionable, which are not, uh, so that they, we can uh, know, meaningfully use the data that we collect, uh, collected through this sensing, uh, census technology. So the, the last two months, actually, we have quite a number of companies coming on board, and now we're talking to more. Uh, so some of the companies are ST Engineering, uh, uh, SLO, uh, Huawei, Ferrero, Rosasso, and so FlexoSense, uh, and Tip Biosystems. So we range from NMCs to LEs to uh, startups. Now, of course, we are supporting organizations like ITE, AI Singapore, NHIC, Enterprise uh, Singapore, and CIMIT. Uh, CIMIT is actually a similar setup like this consortium, but it's based in Boston. And so they actually uh, work a lot with some of the universities in Boston, like uh, Harvard, MIT, Boston U. And of course, they also have a very uh, good hospital systems over there as well. And their aim, again, is to see how they can bring the technologies from the universities to, uh, to the companies and then develop the technologies for use in the hospital. So, so this is actually the Health Technologies Consortium. So this is part of the ecosystem here in Singapore for us to push further this area of health technologies. So, so back to my own work, uh, uh, as Zing has uh, said, actually I have uh, six startup companies. Actually I joined NUS uh, not too long ago, I, I had the first company which is Robust Dynamics. And then uh, 2009, I set up two companies, Clearbridge Nanomedics and Biolytics. 2000, uh, 2013, Clearbridge uh, Micro, uh, uh, and Fluidics. And then 2016, uh, FlexoSense and then 2018 Microchip Technologies. So uh, if I look at myself, I feel that maybe I am myself very interested in entrepreneurship, but at the same time very interested in research. And so uh, actually, you know, we use the term entrepreneurial scientist, although sometimes I use the word academic entrepreneurs. Uh, but either way, uh, I, I guess my aim was to, uh, whatever that I do in the lab, I very much would like to see it being used out there it will benefit patients, and hence I set up all these different companies. Uh, so. So from 2009 onwards are more uh, health related. Uh, 2000 is not, because remember I told you when I first started my, uh, uh, when I first did my PhD was nothing bio at all. I was doing mechanics research at Cambridge. In fact, I was doing impact mechanics. And so in 2000, uh, when I came, uh, when, uh, you know, when I was looking at uh, people starting to use cell phones, because that's a time where we started to shift from pages. If you remember, maybe some of you still remember pages to actually uh, uh, sell handphones. Uh, and when I look at that, I say, but phones are, uh, cell phones like this are so portable, they are uh, very susceptible to drop impact. And so since my area is impact mechanics, uh, so we, we, together my students, we develop an impact drop tester because during that time, uh, the way the phone manufacturers do drop tests is using a phone, you, you hold it at a certain angle and then you let go. And when you let go, obviously the phone may actually rotate and impact the floor. So it may not be impacting at the 
the location that, or position that you want. You, sometimes you want it face down where the uh, panel or the glass, the screen is impacting on the floor. Sometimes you want it to do corner impact. So we developed this, this impact drop tester that can do drop tests of a cell phone at any drop height, at any orientation. And upon impact, actually we can use a high-speed camera and capture the way it impacts. And then we can observe uh, the robustness of the product and then give advice to the companies producing cell phones how best to uh, strengthen certain locations that are very weak. And so um, uh, when I went to give a, uh, a, a presentation in a conference, uh, there were about maybe four or five hundred talks and only ours is one of the two or three that talks about drop impact. And Nokia during the time was the largest, you know, biggest handphone manufacturer in the world. So they, they attended my talk, they got very interested and so they asked me to, they invited me to Helsinki uh, to give a talk to the engineers. And so I got grilled by about 12 engineers and the managers for about three hours. And then later they said, okay, I want to buy your system. I want to buy your drop tester. And so I went back to think about it. I didn't know how to scale up and build the drop tester and sell to them. So, I, so we proposed that instead of selling you the drop tester, why don't we do the drop test for you? And so, so they agreed. So we, we had fun receiving all the latest model of the drug, uh, handphone, cell phones, and then drop test. So we knew when, you know, what kind of phone is going to come out in the market in the next few months. And then we started doing business with also uh, robust emo uh, 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 um, uh, uh, emotional, uh, the, 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 the company that, that produces uh, uh, this uh, Blackberry and also Motorola and so on. Uh, so, so after that, uh, I started to realize that if you drop a phone, uh, actually, uh, it may actually be able to withstand impact. So you don't see any crack at all, but then what happens is the PCB itself, the chip may actually crack. So then I started to actually look into the chip itself and then do some drop impact tests and see on. And then later on, some of the other chip maker companies came to us as well. But it was during the time, as I mentioned to you, was the time where the government started to put a lot of money into biomedical sciences research. And I was uh, roped in to help set up biomedical engineering program. So I thought, that I, I thought maybe I now would like to see if I want to you know, shift my research to use mechanics to study some of the diseases. So one of the first diseases I started to look at was malaria. Uh, and the reason why I look at malaria is because if you look at malaria itself, basically uh, uh, how malaria works is there is a parasite that will go into our bloodstream. And this malaria parasite can go into the blood cell and causes, a, causes, causes massive changes to the blood cell. The blood cell will become very stiff and very sticky. And during that time, I was talking to one of my colleagues at the uh, microbiology department, and he, he was telling me about this problem. A red blood cell becomes stiff and sticky within about one to two days, uh, but they don't know how to uh, quantitatively measure how stiff or how sticky the cell has become. And so as a, as a mechanics person, I said, you know, I would like to take up the challenge, and that's how I started my research into diseases, and we developed some very innovative technologies to measure uh, the, uh, the very quantitative way how red blood cell becomes stiff and sticky uh, as the infection progresses. And then I started going to cancer, and uh, cancer is somewhat a bit different. For certain cancer type, the cell actually becomes less sticky and uh, less stiff. So if you look at how cancer works, if a cancer cell becomes uh, so what happens is when a person has cancer, it develops into a primary tumor. And if the cells don't uh, uh, metastasize or spread, then the patient has benign cancer. By removing the tumor, the patient will recover. But what happens is when the cancer uh, starts, the cells becomes malignant, they can actually detach from primary tumor, starts to make use of, uh, uh, or it will, go, it will actually metastasize to two different routes. One is the lymphatic system, one is the circulatory system. So, so let's, let's take the circulatory system. If the cancer cells starts to detach from primary tumor, it actually squeezes its way into the blood vessel, make use of the circulatory system, and travel from, for example, breast to bone, and form secondary tumor. So that's bad news for the body. And in fact, uh, one reason why the cell becomes less adhesive and loses its adhesion and become more deformable is because through the metastasis process, it's much easier to detach and then squeeze its way out back into another organ to form a secondary tumor. And th so I thought that you know, from a mechanics point of view, it's very interesting. And I did many different tests on the single cell itself. But after that, uh, we realized that actually uh, it will 
it, it makes sense to use this as also one of form of biomarker for us to detect uh, cancer. Because if the cancer cell goes into the circulatory system in blood, uh, if we can take blood from patient, if we can get the cancer cells out, then it's a form of what we call liquid biopsies, which I'm going to talk about very soon. And uh, some of the other companies actually, uh, Clearbridge Nanomedics deals with nanofibers, which we try to, uh, for skin wound healing. Uh, uh, so Biolytics is a company that actually is, uh, is the microfluidic chip that we developed to isolate cancer cells from blood. Uh, and then um, Clearbridge and Fluidics is a, a company which looks at a microfluidic chip that can do single cell analysis. So uh, one reason why we want to do this is because as I mentioned to you, cancer uh, is a very heterogeneous uh, disease. So if you look at cancer cells, uh, they, are very, very, they have many different subtypes. If we can identify what are the cancer cells that constitute the tumor, then we can, uh, with that information, we can better treat the patient. And then after we, we started FlexoSense, uh, which our CEO I think is sitting behind. Uh, FlexoSense actually, uh, uh, we are looking at developing an insole sensor that can help to measure, uh, track foot pressure for diabetic patients, which we're going to talk, talk, uh, talk about afterwards as well. And then microchip technologies actually is a microchip sensor that we develop. Uh, currently, we are looking at VR gaming gloves. Again, I'll talk about this uh, in my next uh, few slides. So let's look at a few examples. So the first example I want to talk about is disrupting cancer diagnosis. Uh, and I, I, I'm, uh, I was telling you about you know, cancer cells uh, can metastasize through the circulatory system. So, so the idea is that if, we, if there are cancer cells in blood, can we actually do what we call liquid biopsies? That means taking blood from, taking cancer cells from blood instead of tumor biopsies. So you look at tumor biopsies, right, it's currently the gold standard. And tumor biopsies is fairly, firstly highly invasive, uh, very painful, you cannot do it frequently. You can do it maybe once before chemotherapy treatment, once after chemo, chemotherapy treatment. You cannot, do it, you cannot do it every two weeks, every month. That's too, too much for the body to bear. Uh, and for patients doing tumor biopsies, they will probably have to stay in the hospital at least half a day to one day. But if we can take blood from patients, like doing a simple blood draw, and we can collect cancer cells from blood, then that is actually at least, uh, a very, uh, it's not very invasive, uh, not very painful. You can do it actually much more frequently every two weeks, every month, which means that you can have a real-time feedback as to the condition of the patient. So you can do a real-time monitoring of the patient. And so, so we were very keen to see how we can uh, uh, go towards uh, uh, you know, doing this liquid biopsies. And of course, uh, uh, when we first talk to the clinicians, they are excited about liquid biopsies, but because tumor biopsies is still the gold standard and they are very resistant to change in the beginning, so we're saying that, oh, sure, I mean, we can still do tumor biopsies, but we can have liquid biopsies as, uh, as a complementary uh, 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 diagnostic techniques uh, for us to do, uh, uh, to, to, to see how we can better uh, diagnose the patients with time. So, so we, we, we developed actually many different microfluidic devices. I'll show you one which I commercialized. So it's actually a spiral microfluidic device. Uh, it's actually a very simple device. We first uh, input blood over here uh, at this uh, blood inlet here, and then allow the blood to flow through a spiral channel. And as it comes out, what happens is uh, the, uh, for some cancer types, the cancer cells are much larger than blood cells. So they will actually get start to focus towards uh, the left side of the channel, whereas the smaller blood cells will get focused on the right side of the channel. So, uh, so you may ask, you know, what, what is this principle uh, all about? It's actually uh, what we call inertial focusing. It's based on this principle of inertial focusing. So if you look at uh, uh, blood cells, right? You have red blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. And typically, they maybe have average uh, diameters, uh, three no, platelets about three microns to uh, diameter about 15 microns for white cells. Uh, but cancer cells, some of the cancer types, uh, cancer uh, cells are about 20 microns and even larger. And so, um, and and as the cells go through a, a curved channel it will actually undergo two types of forces. One is, one is called the lift force, and the other one is called the drag force. Uh, so so in, in, a, in a curve channel, uh, if you look at fluid dynamics in, in such a curve channel, uh, these two forces will act to actually separate the, the cells according to size. So the larger cancer cells will move towards the left side, the smaller cells go to the right side. Let me show you a movie, eventually at the outlet, what happens to the cells. So if you look at this movie over here, 
uh, the top part is where the cancer cells will go to and the bottom part are uh, where the, the blood cells will go to. So by just going through a, a spiral channel like this, the larger cancer cells actually get focused nearer the, the upper uh, the wall and then the, the cells will just go into that channel. And using this technique, we can isolate the, the cancer cells from, from blood cells. So, so using this technique, we are not using any antibody at all to capture the cancer cells. Because if you talk to a lot of clinicians and biologists, uh, they tend to use antibody. But what happens is in cancer itself, in cancer cells, they do express very different proteins at the surface of the, of the cancer cells. So, um, if, so if you were to use one antibody, it may capture a subpopulation of cancer cells, but not all the cancer cells. By using this, uh, this is what we call physical biomarkers, the difference in cell size and cell deformability, we were able to actually capture a lot of the, the cancer cells uh, using this technique. So we have been working a lot on breast, lung, and prostate cancer. These are the three types. But we have also worked with other clinicians to look at ovarian, head and neck, colorectal as well. Uh, it seems to work. But the cancer types that we work the most is uh, breast, lung, and, and, and prostate. And in fact, uh, when, when we first talked to the clinicians, they got very excited. They said, oh, this is a very you know, simple microfluidic chip to use. I just take blood from patient, let's say 7.5 ml of blood, pass through the device, and then we can capture them. But uh, Microfluidic chip is just one thing. To how to use it, uh, you cannot like you know put it on the microscope and ask the technicians to pipette the cells or the blood into the microfluidic chip and then run it and then capture the cells. Because uh, when we talk to the clinicians, they want an idiot-proof system, something very simple to use. So it took us about almost two, maybe three years to develop a system like this, where the chip is mounted in a cartridge and then we can mount it on the top and then we can plug. Uh, plug a tube of blood, about 7.5 ml of blood on the left side, press a button, go away, and then uh, half an hour to 45 minutes later, we can collect the cancer cells on the right side of the tube. Uh, so so we, we, uh, we started this company in 2009. Initially, we called ourselves Clear Beach Biomedics, but because we're an IPO last year, uh, so we, we, we changed our name to Biolytics. And this is what we call a clear cell FX system. We got our CIVD mark as well as uh, China and US FDA listing. So right now, we have installed this system uh, in about 90 locations around the world in the US, uh, UK, Europe, uh, Japan, China, Hong Kong, uh, uh, Australia, Singapore as well. And uh, so we were very fortunate actually this year to, uh, to, won, to, to win the uh, listed company award technology. I think we were the smallest listed company to win this award. And also the IP champion uh, for the IPOS, YPO, IP awards uh, during the IP week uh, just a few weeks ago. So this is a system that we have developed and of course the idea is to enable uh, personalized or precision treat, uh, medicine which means we hopefully can take blood from patient and thereafter use our system to collect the cancer cells and then once you have the cancer cells what clinicians will do is they do sequencing uh, to look at certain mutations especially mutation that is treatable by drug so we call it druggable mutation if that mutation is treatable by drug we can put the information in a medical report like that and then the doctor will know how best to treat the patient by administer the right drug to the right patient instead of uh, currently uh, like for all patients or uh, cancer patients you give the same kind of a regime uh, drug regime gym to the patient. Yeah, so this is actually, uh, 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 we have actually conducted almost 2,000, 3,000 clinical tests uh, around the world uh, using our system. Yeah, so, so that's uh, the cancer story. Next I want to go into is actually diabetes. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're very interested in this because we, as I mentioned, you know, Singapore is now uh, is waging a war against diabetes because Singapore has one of the highest Di uh, diabetic uh, contracting diabetes uh, uh, rate in the world, and uh, we wanted to see how best uh, to uh, you know tackle this disease. And here, what we are trying to aim at is uh, towards what we call zero amputation. So, so now we are waging a war against diabetes, right? In fact, uh, and today, one in three age 65 and above will have diabetes. And there's also a chance of one in three for us to get diabetes in our lifetime as well, which is quite serious. And there are actually complications associated with diabetes. Uh, if we don't take care of our health, if we have diabetes, uh, our body, then we that actually we may face long-term complications such as blindness, uh, kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, and uh, even uh, amputation. And amputation actually relates to uh, food, uh, uh, food diabetic ulcer. So, uh, in fact, uh, 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 what happens is uh, when a patient 
uh, has diabetes, they might sometimes develop ulcer like this. And if they ulcer, what they do is they normally go to a, a polyclinic or GP to see a, a podiatrist. And the podiatrist actually will recommend, um, you know, like for example, total contact casting is one of them. Uh, and the reason why they, they recommend uh, something like this is because one of the best treatment, most effective treatment of diabetes is to minimize pressure acting on the ulcer. Because if the ulcer is at the foot and we are walking, we, 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 we are bound to step on the ulcer. So to minimize the pressure, one way is to wear something like this. And the patient has to wear it for a few weeks to a few months. And in fact, I was talking to some of the clinicians, they say that actually the adoption rate of this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, total contact casting is only 5%. A lot of patients doesn't want to wear something like this because it kind of immobilizes them, uh, you know, they lose their mobility. Of course, there are also other, uh, other uh, 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 um, uh, you know, for example, off-the-shelf diabetic shoe is one of the ways for us to minimize uh, the pressure acting on the foot. So there's a customized insole, very soft to minimize the pressure. But what happens is that uh, because for patients with foot diabetic ulcer, they not, they not only have ulcer, they also suffer from neuropathy, meaning their nerve has been damaged. And so when they walk, they don't feel any pain at all. So if you, you, know, if you look at diabetic patients, uh, some of them in the hospital, they, when they clean their wound, they don't feel any pain. You know, you dig into the wound to remove all the pus and so on. They, they will not scream or shout or uh, whatever because they just don't feel anything at all. So if they don't feel anything at all, which means that when they walk, even if they step on it, they won't know. You know, for us, if there's a small pebble or small you know, stone in the shoe, we can feel it. We want to remove it, uh, but not for diabetic patients. So, so because of this, the next picture will be quite gory. Uh, this is what happens. The, the patient suffers from infection and then they have to have their foot amputated. And the sad thing is that once that happens, many of the patients actually will not survive in the next two years to five years. Uh, and so, so we definitely don't want that to happen you know, to diabetic uh, patients. But unfortunately, in Singapore, we also have one of the highest, highest rate of amputation. So, uh, so we, we, uh, we, we, we developed a technology where we incorporated sensors into the insole uh, of a shoe. So the idea is that uh, we wanted to aim towards a zero amputation by being able to track the pressure that's acting on the ulcer. So if the patient is uh, wearing an insole with the sensors inside it, then uh, firstly, it can enable a very accurate measurement of the in-shoe in uh, pressure uh, for, for the doctor to uh, see how best uh, for the patient, uh, to give advice to how best for a patient to uh, manage the ulcer. Uh, and prevent it from getting worse. And next is uh, for the patients to actually wear this back home. So, so they can actually wear this shoe and the sensor itself can wirelessly uh, communicate with the cell phone. So by tracking the pressure that's exerting on the outside, if the pressure is too much, we can alert the user uh, through the cell phone that the pressure is too high. They have to take a break, rest, adjust their shoe before they actually start to uh, walk again. So the patient may not feel the pain, but hopefully through the cell phone, they can what we call see the pain. Uh, and so let me show you a movie of how it works. So, so this is uh, uh, the, 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 this person is actually wearing the shoe and, and, and the sensor and the insole uh, uh, will actually indicate the pressure acting on the uh, foot as the patient walks. So if the pressure is too high, we will ask the patient to first take a seat and then uh, take a rest and then readjust the shoe. Uh, before uh, you know, saying that, okay, now you can start walking again. So, so with this, uh, this technology, what we try to do is, firstly, we can track how much uh, pressure is acting on the ulcer to alert the patient. Secondly, all the data is accumulated uh, and uploaded to the cloud. And then we will use the AI to compile a report. So hopefully at, this is at the end of the week, the report can be sent to the doctor and the doctor can look at, for this particular patient, whether they have been taking good care of their uh, ulcer. If not, then they can call the patient back uh, you know, for, for, uh, you know, to advise them uh, to really uh, be careful about uh, you know, uh, their ulcer getting worse. Um, of course, yeah, there are people who ask, ask us, you know, so uh, what happens if they don't conform to wearing the shoe itself? Then that itself is also uh, information for the doctor as well. Because right now, if they are using uh, wearing, for example, off the shoe 
the off-the-shelf diabetic shoes. There's no, no uh, the doctor doesn't know at all whether the patient is wearing it or not and whether they're taking care of the ulcer. But with this sensors put into the, the insole, um, then the, uh, the doctor will have actually uh, at least some, some information as to whether the patient has been taking care of their uh, uh, foot ulcers. So, so this is actually uh, one of the start, and we got uh, a pretty uh, good funding from Ministry of Health to develop this. Hopefully next year, uh, we can have the full uh, product uh, for, for uh, to start our clinical trial uh, at, with uh, at NUH. So, so the last one I want to talk about is the microchip technologies. And, and this is actually uh, a very interesting technology. So the first part I'm going to show you is not, not really anything related to healthcare, but we developed these microchip technologies which we can embed into the glove, uh, where we can actually use this uh, to, to play, uh, to do VR or gaming. So, so this is my student who wear this uh, glove and the sensors are embedded into the glove itself. Uh, firstly, we can use this to navigate. For example, playing this game, we can aim and shoot uh, using this glove. So the sensors are embedded in the, in the, in the fingers, uh, you know, different uh, finger part of the glove, and we can use that to activate you know, devices or to play games like this. So, so this is what uh, we have come up with. And uh, what we have done is we actually uh, created this stretchable microfiber sensor. Uh, basically, it's a very small tube, uh, about uh, almost a, like a size or strain of hair, uh, uh, very, very small. Uh, it's hollow in shape, uh, and we fill it with a liquid metal called E-gain. So the, this liquid metal is actually uh, a liquid at, at, at room temperature. So, uh, in fact, we test it up to about minus 20 degrees Celsius. It's still actually in this liquid state. Uh, so, so this sensor itself basically is like a tube with a liquid metal, and how it works is if you stretch it or you press it, you actually deform the tube and the liquid metal displaces. So if you were to apply a current and you were to press it, uh, you get very different signature, electrical signature. So from the signature, you can tell how much forces we are exerting on the sensor. So this is just to show you how it works. So if you were to stretch it, uh, it's very stretchable. In fact, you can stretch up to about 400%. Uh, by stretching, we can actually measure how much force we are stretching it. By pressing it, we can also measure the amount of uh, uh, pressure exerting on the sensor. Uh, in fact, we, uh, there are many applications. Just now I showed you is the VR and, and gaming. Uh, but in fact, uh, we, if you were to actually embed it into a, a fabric like this, uh, we can also activate devices. So if you were to press it, we can actually activate uh, devices. So, so firstly, you can weave it into a fabric, uh, like our, our jacket, and use it to activate devices. Uh, next one is actually we can also use this either for sports or for rehabilitation. So for example, for this case, right, the, the patient let's say, suffers from, from knee injury and they have to go for rehabilitation. So by embedding the sensors into the kinesiology tape, uh, we, on the computer, we can track how many times the patient has bent their knee and how fast. So, uh, so this is actually good for the clinician because, uh, like for example, the physiotherapist, you want to make sure the patient has done 50 times, you know, bending on the knee. Now, the physio physiotherapist doesn't have to be there. By looking at the computer, they know whether this patient has been doing 50 times of the bending on the knee. And also from the signature, you can tell whether uh, the patient has actually made a good, good recovery in terms of the extent of the bending of the knee. So, so the other one I want to talk about is actually measuring uh, 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 pulse or heart rate. So if, if you look at this, right, there's really just one single uh, microfiber sensor woven into the tube. But by, for example, pressing against the inner elbow, uh, and we can actually be able to track uh, the pulse, pulse shape. So, uh, so this is unprocessed uh, signal, but from the signal, uh, very clear, you can see there's a, a pulse shape that we can measure. We can also put it on the wrist, uh, and again, we can measure the pulse. Because uh, this is quite interesting, because we went to China and they asked whether can we do TCM, you know, Bao Mai, you know, using three fingers to track them. We can also put it on the neck to measure the pulse, like the carotid uh, pulse, and then also uh, put it near the foot to see if we can measure the dorsalis pedis pulse monitoring. Uh, this is quite interesting because, as I mentioned to you, for patients, uh, diabetic patients, uh, sometimes they, they suffer 
of a neuropathy, also partly because uh, the blood didn't, uh, were not able to flow uh, into the foot itself. So we want to do what we call perfusion or the microvasculature in the foot. So if when you do that, uh, we can use this device to track whether there are indeed blood flowing into the foot of the patient. So these are some of the very interesting uh, medi uh, medical applications for such a sense, uh, microfiber sensors that we developed in my lab. So, uh, so before I end, I just want to say that actually this is not a one lab effort. In fact, uh, we are always uh, into very interdisciplinary kind of uh, collaboration, not only uh, uh, with the clinicians, but also scientists as well. Uh, so so we, we, ours is considered uh, what we call deep tech because uh, we really, whatever we've developed is based on real, you know, research and based on science, uh, uh, science uh, scientific knowledge uh, uh, that we have uh, gained uh, 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 through doing all the research, uh, all the laboratory experiments. And certainly uh, uh, getting involved scientists is so very important. And not just, not just uh, um, uh, any scientist. For example, for myself as an engineer, I do also work with uh, cancer biologists because I felt that I also need to know uh, a little bit about cancer as well uh, to better develop technologies that can help, for example, diagnose cancer. So, so patient and scientists, and of course, uh, patient is very important. Actually, we don't know who the patients are. Many of the times when we do, uh, for example, uh, a blood test, we don't know who are the patients patients that gave us the blood, but we are very thankful to them because when we talk to the clinicians, they say that actually some of the patients are very sick. Uh, and to donate another 10 ml of blood is actually a lot for them because they already donated, or they already been, you know, they already take 40 ml of blood from them for other tests, and now they have to give another 10 ml of blood for research. And so we are very thankful for, to, to the patients for actually donating their, their sample to us to, to do all these different tests. And of course, industrialists and investors are very important as well because if we want to be able to develop finally a, a product that we can use uh, in the clinic, we still have to get investment you know, money to uh, eventually develop it into actual product. Uh, and that, that, cost, that takes time, money. Uh, so. And also, we are, we, we, for ourselves, we know med tech or health tech itself has a very long runway compared to any other type of technology. Uh, it's typically at least about 10 years, if not 15 years, because you have to go through all the regulatory approval uh, all the clinical trial and tests. So if you want to go into this space, you must be prepared for the long haul. Uh, and investors also must also understand that it's going to take time eventually for the product uh, to be you know, uh, used eventually or to be sold in the market. Now, because we are very thankful to the government and regulatory agencies for all the funding support and, and also the, all the regulatory uh, you know, steps that we have to take to, to see this uh, technology eventually being used. And uh, before I end, actually, uh, I've been working a lot with clinicians for the last you know, 15, 20 years. And uh, there was a very senior uh, clinician at NUHS actually tell me this uh, when we were you know, talking about, uh, uh, about some of the problems we are solving. And he says, actually, that uh, a doctor can only treat one patient at a time, but medical technology developed by an engineer can treat thousands thousands of patients anywhere at any one time. And I thought this is a very good encouragement for us, especially engineers who are developing technology, because we want it to, be, to benefit uh, patients. And, uh, and we, we truly believe in technology that, uh, in being able to help us do that. And so, uh, and, and that's also one reason why clinicians are very, very willing to work with us engineers and hopefully develop biomaker bio, bio technologies that can really uh, eventually uh, benefit thousands or if not millions of patients. So with that, I've come to the end of my talk and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Yes. I had a question about the microtubes. Yes. Uh, I was wondering whether it needs a battery. So say, if you do wearables, yeah. uh, does it need um, a battery in the clothes? Or if yeah, you, okay. Yeah, in which case, um, is it uh, efficient enough to right. um, yeah. run for a long time on a, on a fairly that's uh, small right, yeah. battery? So, so that's a very good question. Uh, suddenly, the sensor is just one part of it. You still need to have a battery source. And also, for example, it's wireless. You need a Bluetooth adapter as well in there. And um, uh, of course, when we were developing the technology, we were looking at what are the sensing elements, what kind of uh, sensing element to use. For this case, we are using a liquid as a sensing element, and we are using uh, E-gain, eutectic gallium idium. And E-gain uh, has very low resistance, about a few ohms. Uh, previously, we were using 
you, you even try, for example, water with uh, graphene suspended particles inside there, and that was a mega ohm. So, so this e game will not take up too much of the battery mm -hmm. size. So, uh, so it depends on the usage. It could normally last uh, a few days to a week or even two weeks. Okay. Yeah, because they are very small. They are very tiny because the, the inner diameter is only about 10 to a few hundred microns. Yeah, so so we don't need a lot of power, uh, power uh, a lot of uh, you know, battery to, to power the, the sensor itself. Okay. Yeah. So I remember older uh, wearable techs they uh -huh. would, uh, require a lot more power and uh, that's right. Batteries yeah. And correct. Correct. Like yeah. So now we are miniaturizing it. Yeah. Of course, the the, the 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 bulk of it is still the Bluetooth adapter. Yeah. You know that that's the the big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. The radio must uh, require right. more power. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Prof Lim, could you talk about some of the challenges you face in terms of uh, getting adoption and then right. uh, public policy po uh, perspective? Mm. What are some of the nudge factors you, we have learned from other places that can promote adoption through nudging consumer to, uh, to, to, to adopt these kind of technology? Right. Yeah, I must say when I first started my lab uh, doing such research work, uh, you know, almost close to 20 years ago, there are very a few clinicians who really appreciate what we are doing. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, uh, it was very difficult to work with them, but we, we persevered, we, we do our research, we publish results that will show that it works. So, so once, uh, once we get the attention of the clinicians and they, they realize that actually some technologies are very useful to them, uh, to enable such technology to be better adopt, uh, adopted, uh, the, as I mentioned, the, the best way is first to talk to the clinician, what are the uh, clinical unmet needs that they have. Um, and uh, once uh, they have certain problems they're encountering, they need uh, solutions. And if we work with them on developing solutions, then they can actually devote their attention and time to working with us to work towards that, 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 that uh, solution that we're going to develop. So once you develop technology, then eventually they will be more keen to uh, adopt it for use uh, uh, in, the, in the clinic. Now, of course, it's not that, that simple. Of course, it has to also go through all the regulatory approval, clinical trial, and so on. Uh, so working with the government is also very important, or the regulatory agency is also very important as well. Um, but um, the important part of it, or the, the, the gist of it, is that yeah, we have to first uh, find a problem that would be of interest to clinicians. Because when we work with them, we found that they themselves are very busy. They have no time to come for meetings every, every day or, or even once a week. But if it's something they are very passionate about, something they want to solve, then they, they will definitely come and spend time with us. So identify what the problems they're encountering, and if something that is of interest to me, I'll be happy to work with them uh, to solve that problem. Yes. Hi, hi, Prof Lim. I'm hi. Jonathan. Yes. I'd like to ask you a few more questions okay. on our aging population. Um, given that you say that we are living longer, mm. and that we're going to see about just under a million seniors in 10 years' time. Right. And with chronic illnesses looking to escalate significantly, um, probably preventative measures are needed. But what could you share uh, potentially are preventative technologies that could be deployed at scale mm. um, cost effectively right. to prevent mm. um, this from spiraling out of control. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So that has to do with uh, maybe also part uh, part of our aim, uh, which is prevention. Uh, you know, if we if we can enable patients not to develop the chronic disease in the first place, that would be the best. And in fact, in the uh, I mean, back in our lab in the, in the, in the university, we also been talking about what are the different technologies we can develop uh, to do that. Uh, basically, uh, for example, uh, are there uh, technologies like like wearable devices that the person can wear to uh, tell them about, for example, the kind of food they're eating, whether it's healthy or not, uh, steps to take uh, a day. Uh, you know, these are actually already kind of trying to be uh, being implemented. Uh, in fact, uh, this, this during lunch now, I was talking to, to some of our uh, colleagues, and then we were saying that uh, actually, if you talk about wearable devices, right, trackers, actually some of the senior uh, citizens may not like to wear them. Uh, some of them may not be as technology savvy and, and they may not uh, really, you know, if they wear it, uh, you know, whether they will act upon the information that has been collected through wearable devices. Uh, so there has to be a way where this, this, 
this data collected has to be maybe routed to their GP or doctor, and a doctor then can give advice to the patients. Uh, you know. So that is actually one part of it, uh, whether the, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, our uh, no senior citizens would, would, or even any of us will be willing to wear devices like this on a daily basis and collect data. The other thing is, uh, we're also looking at some technologies that is so, uh, that is already uh, what we are using in our everyday life. So uh, one example would be the, the bed that we are sleeping on. Maybe in future, you know, when we, uh, we buy our bed of mattress, is, is there are sensors in it that can track our sleeping pattern. So it's something that we don't wear, but it's certainly something that we use. You know, we, we do sleep on it. Uh, even, uh, for example, uh, when we wake up in the morning, we look at the mirror. Uh, is there a way where we can do, from the mirror, do scanning of our face or whatever to you know, see if we can uh, come up with certain uh, uh, track uh, or be able to uh, collect information with regard to our uh, health on that very morning? Uh, in fact, we're also talking about devices like embedded into a toothbrush because we brush our, brush our teeth every day whether we can use that as a means to sample some of our saliva, for example, uh, for quick analysis, uh, whether, you know, uh, we are, how, how we are doing health-wise. Uh, another interesting concept is uh, even, like, for example, uh, the toilet bowl itself, you know, whether we are, uh, you know, whether it's a small business or big business that we're doing on the toilet bowl. Maybe you, you, there are certain, uh, hopefully you can develop uh, toilet bowls that can sample our stool or urine, uh, you know, to, to mix, uh, to have some analysis. Or even when we are taking a shower, there are also some, uh, s um, some uh, uh, for example, I was reading some of the magazines that say, for example, there's a camera that can scan our whole body to look for uh, possible uh, a melanoma, you know, certain more that may be developing that look quite, uh, you know, uh, quite odd. Uh, so, so maybe if we can tap on some of these uh, devices that, uh, or, or, or tools that we use every day, uh, that might be one way that can continue to help track our, track our health. Of course, uh, using such, for example, if you embed sensors into the into the toothbrush or even a toilet bowl, right? It's an everyday sampling. Of course, sometimes they may be anomaly. You know, uh, the the night before we eat, we have a very big dinner, uh, but it's like tracking over time. Maybe half a year, one year, or two years later, there's some some uh, you know some trends indicating that we may be on the onset of a disease. Then uh, we can use that information to better uh, advise the patient or the the user what to do. Yeah, Dr. Tim, I'd uh, like to share with you. I have read some research uh, talking about the stem cell oh, right. that is able to help to improve the cancer situation. Mm -hmm. So may I know, do you have any uh, comments on this sort of research? Right. Uh, so I don't really do too much on uh, stem cells. Uh, uh, my previous research that I do was actually uh, maybe a bit of uh, stem cells is through tissue engineering. Like for example, uh, uh, certain uh, uh, tissues like uh, you know skin and so on. So um, I, I think for, for cancer itself, uh, certainly uh, one of the hottest hottest topic now is actually immunotherapy. That means using our own immune system to kill the cancer cells. And uh, so uh, I'm not sure about stem cells, but but I think one of the more effective treatments people are looking at is actually uh, immunotherapy, meaning uh, you take your own uh, immune cells and then make it more effective in being able to, to attack the cancer cells. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, just wondering how susceptible some of these technologies are to comm commoditization, like how fast the state of the art is moving. Because mm. uh, I was thinking about the, the long and costly development and yeah. if uh, the state of the art is moving very quickly, then it's hard to make sense of uh, whether or not it's uh, worthwhile to invest. Right, right. So yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so there are, uh, you know, for example, I, I, I work on cancer, right, and, uh, on cancer diagnosis uh, uh, using microfluidic devices. Uh, on a daily basis, there are always a lot, uh, many publications, many technologies that develop uh, around the world also trying to diagnose cancer. Uh, and... Uh, Eventually, a very small, tiny percentage will make it to the market and become a product. Uh, and uh, well, one reason is because, firstly, uh, uh, as a professor, not, not, not all of us are, are, are that savvy enough to bring it to the market. And secondly, uh, as a professor, 
our KPI is still publication. Once you publish the paper, you prove a concept, then you move on. You don't even bother to actually try to push it and bring it to the market. You probably might interest someone else to do it, license it. Uh, so even if it's state of the art, sometimes some of these technologies don't get, uh, get commercialized. Uh, but I also know that there are some technologies, for example, uh, uh, in Harvard, for example, uh, uh, even MIT, they, 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 they get commercialized, but eventually you didn't see fruition. That means maybe after two, three years, uh, the company closed down. Uh, so there are many factors involved uh, technology is only one of them, but uh, uh, as, uh, no, there are many other factors that inf affect, uh, I mean, uh, influence whether the, uh, the technology will, can withstand the, the test of time, cross the value of death, and eventually be used as a product. Yeah, so yeah, 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 that's too many uh, factors to consider. Yeah. Yes. Um, so with the microtube technology, yes. you've already uh, use it quite a bit in VR games. I was wondering if you foresaw any kind of application in the serious games technology. Yeah, that's future. a very good question. Yeah, so we do. Uh, we are talking to some people that are doing serious games. Uh, I know people in the hospitals for uh, training. Uh, that. Uh, so uh, we we are definitely looking into that. Yeah. Uh, so our our uh, te microchip technologies actually give uh, the. For example, the glove, the ability to sense, but there's also another very important component, which is the haptic, haptic part of it. Yeah, so we are also trying to develop that part as well. So it's both hapt haptic plus sensing. Yeah. Uh, may I yes. ask what's your take on uh, bioresonance technology? For you, like man, many people around have seen, like you take some electrode and it kind of scans your know, electromagnetic waves and based on that uh, tells what kind of illnesses you could have. And I have seen like this technology has been developed in the last 20 years like significantly, uh, like being able to predict where there's osteoporosis or uh, things like some gland is not working or something like that, or diabetes including. So what's your take where those technologies are leading to? Are they precise enough, like for example? Mm -hmm. Or is it just a scam? Uh, because it's like very easy to scale. Those ones, right? So sorry, I, I didn't get the, the examples that you cited. Uh, can uh, you kind of repeat them? Of the BR resonance, you have heard of that, right? So that's kind of scanning the electromagnetic waves of yours. And uh, the one case I have seen myself was like, for example, diagnosing osteoporosis or diagnosing like sugar diabetes or something right. like that. Right. Seem to be precise enough for this point of time, right? Just what's your take on that? Yeah, so uh, yes, you're right. I mean, like, for example, if I develop a certain technology, uh, it has to be clinically validated first. Of course, first, it, uh, it's based on uh, you know, uh, some scientific principles, right? Then we develop technology, and then we have to first clinically validate it, uh, which means we have to do tests on volunteers or patients. But at the same time, we try to benchmark it against another proven technology and see whether the results we get are similar. Uh, so uh, if they are still not the same, uh, they give the same outcome, uh, then they give us some confidence as to the, you know, uh, that the technology is actually working. Uh, but uh, normally there is, uh, uh, that's why I mentioned, you know, we have to go through not only clinical trials and tests, regulatory approval and so on, because these are the steps to take to actually validate the, the technology. So, 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 um, yeah, so for example, when I read, when I read papers, right, uh, and, and papers, you know, some people publish uh, about the development of certain technology and say, oh, our voice is the most sensitive, the fastest, you know, the, the lightest, and so on. Uh, you tend to take it with a pinch of salt unless they are really uh, gone through that, that step of a clinical validation with, uh, with a large number of uh, tests with patients and healthy volunteers. Uh, if not, then there's always, a, you know, some, some uh, uh, some doubt about whether, you know, what they say is true. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Thank uh, you. So one of the examples that you mentioned was uh, people uh, eating right and maybe uh, having mm -hmm. healthier habits. So yeah. is that, uh, are those kinds of application also a part of the initiative? Like uh, right. helping people maybe exercise more and yes. yeah. having a community uh, involved together? Right, yeah. So uh, yes, I mean, uh, the, uh, for example, uh, one of our colleagues is working on uh, using cell, uh, the, the phone, uh, the smartphone to take pictures of the food to kind of determine how much calories the person will be taking. 
uh, and then uh, the, the firm will analyze that over the last few days or week, uh, the, the calorie intake and whether they, you know, whether uh, the person should now, you know, consider eating less uh, for that day and so on. Uh, and of course, fitness tracker as well. Like, uh, let's say they set a goal, maybe 10,000 steps a, a day, uh, whether the person has reached, if not, then it will kind of uh, prompt the user uh, whether they should maybe uh, spend an hour walking around or, or so on. So that the idea actually is to have a device that will uh, uh, give personal nudges to the, to the user uh, to adopt a more healthier lifestyle. Uh, but whether the user eventually do it or not, <laughs> that's another, an, a, another story. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, otherwise, the technology is, is there actually to, to help uh, patients do that. Of course, the, the, uh, back in our institute, uh, we also uh, developed some AI modules as well to, give, to do proper analysis. As I mentioned, uh, we may collect a lot of data, but the data may not make sense to us unless uh, it is what we call actionable. Yeah, so it has to, according to this, this particular person, uh, whether the data they collect uh, you know, uh, means they have to do certain as, uh, 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 perform uh, certain like do certain exercises or, or take uh, walk more and so on. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Prof. Lee, yeah. Lin, uh, for your en enlightening presentation and for okay. you guys for your questions. We are now move on to the networking session. So feel free to catch uh, Professor Lim for any other questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of people have a lot of questions, so you may just... Hello, I'm 